So before I begin, first of all, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be here today. Uh, uh, Kingman and, uh, and Sushil are, are certainly two of my favorite people. Uh, Sushil, because I've, I've known him uh, coming up through the Hopkins system, and I've always had that maintained the connection to the, the sleep program there. Um, and because he's my favorite editor in chief. <laughs> Later. Um, he is he is certainly I, I would rate him as the, the greatest editor in chief um, in the in the sleep world. Um, and without him, I might not be giving this talk today. But I'm going to move straight ahead and very quickly into today's topic. Uh, the reason is I, I suspect that most of you have never heard what you're about to hear. There's a tremendous amount that I want to cover. Um, I can't cover it all in depth, so I've put together a bibliography uh, so that you can go and read about some of these ideas um, that I'm not going to be able to discuss in detail. But the subject is, is really very simple. Why are sleep apnea patients sleeping? And what most of you are, are familiar with is the... Um, let me just move this out of the way. Okay, so what you're familiar with is the typical uh, first paragraph of any sleep paper explanation. This one is a, is a website by the World Health Organization. They ask the question, what is obstructive sleep apnea syndrome? They say obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is a clinical disorder marked by frequent pauses in breathing during sleep, usually accompanied by loud snoring. These pauses cut off the oxygen supply to your body for a few seconds and halt the removal of carbon dioxide, spoken like true pulmonologists. As a result of this, your brain briefly wakes you up, reopens the airway, and restarts breathing. This can occur many times during the night and makes proper sleep impossible. In the day, you may experience excessive daytime sleepiness, difficulty in concentrating, or headaches. At night, sleep is the most common feature. This is the typical sleep fragmentation picture we tell our patients about. You're waking up hundreds of times a night, so you're very sleepy during the day. This is not really true. Um, and the first portion of this lecture, I'm going to look at the data that explains um, the source of sleepiness and sleep disordered breathing, or at least points toward it. What I'm going to conclude is that the frequency of apneas and hypopneas is not the main driver of sleepiness among patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring is the main driver of sleepiness among patients with obstructive sleep apnea. And where am I going to get this information from? I'm going to start with the, with the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study. Uh, this is data that you that certainly uh, all of you my age uh, are familiar with. It was an NIH-funded study in the late 1980s. Um, it was written as an epidemiologic component of the University of Wisconsin's application to be a specialized center for cardiopulmonary disorders of sleep. So a bunch of epidemiologists were doing the research. It was utilized. It utilized in-lab polysomnography to determine the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, which back in the late 1980s meant obstructive sleep apnea plus hypersomnolence, in a sample of Wisconsin state employees, and that followed them over time. And the study was done uh, before the EPWIS, or was begun before the EPWIS sleepiness scale came into use in 1990. Um, so it defined hypersomnolence for our purposes as the presence of three symptoms, um, and it was classified as either present or absent. So it wasn't a graded hypersomnolence. It was you're either hypersomnolent or you're not. And you were hypersomnolent if you had involuntary sleep episodes plus non-restorative sleep at night plus sleepiness affecting your daytime functioning. And you needed all three of them most days. Then they followed their cohort over time. 
1993, Terry Young, an epidemiologist, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, The Occurrence of Sleep Disordered Breathing Among Middle-Aged Adults. This is the first attempt to find out how common is sleep apnea in middle-aged people in the United States. And um, they took their 600 plus patients, not patients, I'm sorry, uh, participants, um, who were all state employees in Wisconsin, and they just, est they estimated for the entire uh, population of Wisconsin, uh, the prevalence of sleep apnea in men and women, and the prevalence of sleep apnea syndrome in men and women. And here in their uh, abstract is the important information. The estimated prevalence of sleep disordered breathing defined as the apnea hypopnea score of five or higher was 9% in women, 24% in men. We estimated that 2% of women and 4% of men in the middle-aged workforce meet the minimal diagnostic criteria for the sleep apnea syndrome, by which they meant an AHI greater than five, together with daytime hypersomnolence. That was the important measure. And this was very important data in their minds. Why? Because they wanted to be able to tell the world how important a disorder is this? How big a burden do we have in our society with sleepy people based upon sleep apnea? So this data was very important. Now, uh, I'm giving you here the, how they characterize their assessment of hypersomnolence. Daytime hypersomnolence was assessed um, with three subjective questions on sleepiness. Using a five-point scale, the subjects rated how often they felt excessively sleepy during the day, how, how often they woke up unrefreshed, regardless of how long they slept, and had uncontrollable daytime sleepiness that interfered with daily living. So those are the three questions. And any response of frequent or habitual more than two days per week were considered to indicate hypersomnolence. And now here, you need to focus on the underlying lines. The occurrence of hypersomnolence. The prevalence of hypersomnolence did not vary according to age, but it was higher among women than in men. Here it goes. As compared with subjects with little or no sleep disordered breathing, that means people with an AHI below five and no, um, no snoring. Habitual snorers and subjects with apnea hypopnea scores of five or higher were significantly more likely to have hypersomnolence. There were two groups of people that were more hypersomnolent than people with an AHI of five who, who said they never snored. And one of those two groups was habitual snores with an AHI less than five. Now, this is a problem. This doesn't show up in the abstract. And these epidemiologists, are trying to determine how big a burden does our society have from sleep disordered breathing, and particularly sleep apnea syndrome, which is associated with hypersomnolence. But because they believe that sleep apnea only applies to people with an AHI above five, they considered sleep apnea syndrome to be people with an AHI above five who also were hypersomnolent. And they completely ignored, and that's the word, the habitual snorers who were hypersomnolent. Now I'm going to ask you a question. So their so the conclusions are actually unwarranted. Their findings invalidated their study. They needed to go back and redefine the burden to include habitual snorers. I'm going to ask another question, or actually, I'm going to ask my first question. What percentage? would you guess, of people with an apnea hypopnea, in, apnea hypopnea index above five were also habitual snorers? And I'm not expecting to hear everybody calling out, <laughs> but, but I'm guessing that you're all thinking, heck, they were all habitual snorers. Everybody with an apnea hypopnea index above five was likely a habitual snorer. So then let me ask you a question. What was more associated with hypersomnolence? An apnea hypopnea index above five 
for habitual snoring. Okay, now, now for those people like Dr. Sproul and Dr. Patil, who've known this study their entire lives, you've never seen it this way. You don't know the data that has been sitting in front of you, and particularly if you only read the abstract. And let me assure you, before I go any further, I have been guilty of everything I'm going to accuse you of throughout my career. I'm no better than any of you. The only reason I know this is because I had to go back and look at the data. So the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort study actually showed that being a habitual snorer increases the risk of severe daytime sleepiness independent of an apnea hypopnea index above five. And now we're gonna to come to a second study that is famous. Um, the actual paper is the relation of sleepiness to RDI. And for those of you who are not familiar with the sleep heart health study, when they use the term RDI, they mean apnea hypopnea index. That's literally what they mean. They're not talking about RERAS. So, so this is um, a study done by Gottlieb and his associates, published in 1999. And um, it was actually data collected in that, from 1995 to 1997 as the sleep heart health study began. I'm going to say very briefly that the Sleep Heart Health Study ultimately included 5,700 participants who were parts of um, heart health epidemiologic studies going on all over the United States. One was going on at Case Western also. And sleep studies were added to um, the heart health studies so that they could track not only the heart health, but also a priori where these people started in terms of having uh, ob obstructive sleep apnea. So they took the first 1,824 participants. All of them had to have an acceptable in-lab polysomnogram, and all of them had to complete an Epworth sleepiness scale. And that's all you're going to need to know for this study. And here is the important piece of data, um, table two. Here they show you how many how their subjects mapped out. About half of them, of the 1,800 study uh, patient participants, half of them did, had an RDI of less than five. And then there were about 500 with an RDI of five to 15. Uh, there were 211 with 15 to 30, and then greater than 30. So most of you would think of this as mild, moderate, and severe obstructive sleep apnea, the way we've arbitrarily classified it. In our, in our modern era. So I'll refer to these as mild, moderate, and severe sleep apnea. And these are people who don't have sleep apnea. And this is the important take home. The Epworth sleepiness scale scores, this is the first study to use Epworths. If you didn't have an RDI above five, you were at 7.2. If, if you had mild sleep apnea, you were at 7.8. If you had moderate sleep apnea, you were at 8.3. And if you had severe sleep apnea, you were at 9.3. And it turns out by analysis of variance that each one of these scores was, a stati was statistically significantly different than every other score. So right away, Gottlieb and his associates were able to tell you, see, daytime sleepiness is correlated with, um, with the AHI. Um, OK. Let's be honest, 7.8 and 8.3 is not a big difference in sleepiness. And when you go from moderate sleep apnea to everything from an AHI of 30 up to maybe 120, if you only go up one more point in the, in the Epworth score, this is not a, a, a clinically impressive change in sleepiness across the entire realm of sleep disordered breathing. Um, but it is statistically significant. So let's credit them with that. But now, once again, let's look at all the data. Same paper. And we're going to look at two panels. The top panel is Epworth sleepiness scale on your y-axis. And you've got the same groupings and the same Epworth sleepiness scale score. So here you, are, the, here you are with the 900 individuals, half the individuals who had an AHI below 5 had a mean Epworth of 7.2. The mild patients were at 7.8 the moderate at 8.3, 
and the severe at 9.3. And now we're just gonna take this group, half the patients who had an AHI below five. We're taking them down here to this panel, and we're gonna focus on two subgroups. The group that never snored, whose mean Epworth was 5.7, and the group with an AHI below five who did snore, who had a mean Epworth of 7.8, identical to the mild sleep apnea patients. So here we are, we go, we, we're in AHI below five, we go from not snoring to snoring, and we have a massive increase in sleepiness from 5.7 to 7.8, or 2.1 points, Epworth points. The entire spectrum of sleep apnea doesn't increase that much. Not a word in the abstract, really. The main driver of sleepiness in their 1800 patients was going from never snoring to snoring at an AHI below five. That's just what the data shows. They don't push that at all. What they push is C, AHI, and sleepiness are correlated. Now, here's where it's at. But to their credit, uh, and I, I'm very grateful to, um, in fact, let me, let me go back here for a moment. For the rest of this lecture, remember this. There's a big bump as we go from never snoring to snoring. And then you get maybe the next biggest bump when you go from moderate sleep apnea to severe sleep apnea. Remember this, snoring and severe sleep apnea. That's where the big bumps in sleepiness seem to come. And to the credit of, uh, of Gottlieb and, and his associates, they were bothered by the data I just showed you. They wanted to know, does snoring predict sleepiness independently of apnea hypopnea frequency? They didn't mention it in their paper, but they came back and wrote another paper about it when the complete collection of 5,700 patients was complete. Uh, and they published that about a year later. And so what they've done is they took the total of, uh, of patients in the uh, sleep heart health study, they divided them up by snoring frequency, which they had, and they have the EPRO sleepiness scale, um, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. They have the percent that were sleepy based on an EPRO of greater than 10, okay? So this is no longer the EPRO sleepiness scale, it's the percentage of patients in each category that were sleeping. And you see, as you go from never snoring to snoring six to seven nights a week, you have a progressive increase in the percentage of people who are sleeping from about 15% to about 40%. And it runs right up there as the frequency of snoring increases. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you their conclusion from this study, I'm not gonna take you through the whole study. They say the effects of snoring and AHI or RDI on sleepiness were little affected by adjustment for age, sex, race, body mass index, or questionnaire evidence of insufficient sleep time or nocturnal, or nocturnal leg jerks or cramps. We conclude that both snoring and RDI are independently associated with excessive sleepiness in community-dwelling middle-aged and older adults. This snoring frequency was independently associated with, um, with sleepiness, even though as the snoring frequency went up, the RDI also went up. But snoring still made an independent contribution. And one more piece of data from this study. They were thinking, and Gottlieb was thinking, you know, it's got to be that snoring gives rise to rearers, right? I mean, it's got to be sleep fragmentation. It's got to be that people who snore, as the frequency of snoring goes up, the tendency to have arousals goes up. So we've got to be able to show that. So what they did was they looked at the arousal index as a function of increasing apnea hypopnea index. They have a large number of people here, about 4,500 people, I think. Um, and they did show, in fact, that as the RDI went up, the frequency of arousals went up a bit. 
All right, that's not surprising. Then they looked at the snoring frequency, nights per week, and they showed again that as the snoring frequency went up, the, um, the frequency of arousals went up a bit. But then they factored out the RDI from the arousal frequency in the snores because both went up together. And they found out then when they took out the apneas and hypopneas and the snoring and the arousals associated with them, that in fact, as the frequency of snoring went up, even though the frequency of sleepiness went up, the actual frequency of arousals did not go up. What they're actually showing here is that really not the cause of, snor of snoring related sleepiness. There is or not the cause. Of course, the uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine has now counted RIRAs in the RDI because they've got to be causing sleepiness. They seem not to have read this paper from the sleep or health study or discounted it. And it was really very disturbing to, to Gottlieb and his associates that, um, that they couldn't explain the increased sleepiness on the basis of snoring. Okay. So, from this data, um, from this data, we conclude that being a snorer increases the risk of daytime sleepiness, independent of an AHI above five, and both studies confirm that. And the increasing prevalence of sleepiness associated with increasing frequency of snoring is unrelated to the frequency of arousals from sleep, and that's from the sleep heart health study. And now we're entering part two of this talk. And that is, we're going to address the question if arousal frequency is not related to the level of sleepiness among snorers, what is? And here we need to talk briefly about the functional somatic syndromes. And this is a group of syndromes that are rampant in society. If you just look at some of the names, you probably all know somebody who's got at least one of them. There's fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia body pain associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. You've got migraine headache, tension headache syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, temporal mandibular joint syndrome. A lot of dentists are dealing with that. A lot of your sleep patients have bruxism. Or, and those of you who are in the VA have seen some war related illness particularly Gulf War illness, but there's been plenty coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan more recently. Burn pit illness. Um, for those of you who, who, who think that restless leg syndrome is a sleep disorder, in the 1980s, when the interrelatedness of the functional somatic syndromes was recognized, restless leg syndrome was also considered a functional somatic syndrome. And that has some import. Then there's mitral valve prolapse syndrome, joint hypermobility syndrome, all of these syndromes, while they each seem to have some unique features like irritable bowels or body pain, they share in common a heck of a lot. They all are associated with fatigue. All of these patients have problems with sleep, either sleepiness or insomnia. Um, headaches are very common among all of them. Body pain is common among all of them. And in many of them, actually in all of them, in many of the individuals, there's depression and anxiety. All of these patients, and they may constitute maybe 25% uh, maybe of the American population, share these in common. In 2003, I published a paper, and, and to, to explain why I published this paper, I was one of the non-believers in upper airway resistance syndrome. And, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Ricardo Stuz is with us today, was the second author of Dr. Guillemino's paper introducing upper airway resistance syndrome. And just between the group of us here, he also did all the work. He's a, he was the pulmonologist who put down the esophageal balloons and actually studied flow and effort in these patients. Um, and we in the world of sleep medicine, five months after the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study, showed us that habitual snorers could be sleepy, even if their AHI was below five, when Guillaume and Ellen Stews came out with their information, we told them they were crazy, even though the Wisconsin group showed the same thing. 
Um, and I was one person who told them they were crazy, but within the next two, three years, in my sleep lab that I'd started at the VA, I began to see snorers who were sleepy. And I began to treat them with nasal CPAP because I didn't have to justify treating them to their insurance companies. And, uh, and I began to see that even people who didn't snore audibly had inspiratory airflow limitation because I was putting down esophageal catheters to, me to measure uh, inspiratory effort as part of my nasal CPAP titration because that's the way I was taught to do it at Hopkins. Um, so I was a big believer in UARS. And in the late 1990s, I was brought over to Stony Brook, Stony Brook uh, University Hospital, to begin seeing non-veterans there. And I began seeing a lot of women, and I began to notice symptoms of functional somatic syndromes in patients with upper airway resistance syndrome. Um, what did I see? I saw alpha delta sleep. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, you're looking at slow wave sleep here. There's a 15 second window done on paper. Um, you're seeing the delta waves, the high amplitude, low frequency waves, and you're seeing the superimposed alpha waves. And alpha delta sleep was well known to be associated with both fibromyalgia and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I was seeing it in upper airway resistance syndrome patients who didn't have either diagnosis. And so I went through and took. 50, I'm sorry, 25 consecutive patients with three levels of sleep disordered breathing, upper airway resistance syndrome, which for me was an AHI below 10, mild to moderate sleep apnea, which I defined as an apnea hypopnea index of 10 to 40, and moderate to severe sleep apnea, any apnea hypopnea index above 40. These, this definition was how Hopkins a classified sleep apnea back in the 1980s and probably the first part of the 1990s. And I showed a very high uh, prevalence of sleep onset insomnia, 35% of UARS patients, headaches in 50% of UARS patients, irritable bowel syndrome in about 45% of, irritable bowel, of um, UARS patients. Here's the alpha delta sleep in about a quarter of them. Bruxism, 50%. Right, that's associated with TMJ, um, GERD, which goes with the IBS. So, and uh, depression. I was, for some reason, I wasn't interested in anxiety, but about a third of my UARS patients were depressed, but a fair number of the non UARS sleep disorder breathing patients also had many of these symptoms. I didn't pay attention much to that. But I showed that there was a, a, a connection, a link between the functional somatic syndromes and UARS. And if the functional somatic syndrome patients could be sleepy, maybe that explained the sleepiness of UARS patients. Maybe the mechanism was the same. On the basis of this um, study, I asked a bunch of questions. The one I just told you, what's the mechanism for this association between, between mild OSA and symptoms of functional somatic syndromes? Is their sleepiness something that they also have in common? Are all patients with functional somatic syndromes characterized by mild obstructive sleep apnea? Nobody had ever looked at the functional somatic syndromes in terms of whether or not they had sleep disordered breathing. And does treating mild obstructive sleep apnea in individuals with functional somatic syndromes, does it relieve their symptoms of sleepiness and fatigue, but also of the functional somatic syndromes? Nobody had ever treated them with CPAP. I'm not going to show you the studies. I'm going, to re I'm going to summarize our findings in the three groups that we looked at. And then I'm going to go into somewhat more detail about the Gulf War illness patients. So we did a case series in which we, had in which we showed that 27 of 28 females with fibromyalgia demonstrated inspiratory airflow limitation during sleep. But when I say inspiratory airflow limitation, I'm going to assume you all know that I mean either audible snoring or inaudible inspiratory airflow limitation, but fluttering of the upper airway during sleep. And uh, since Sushil is now among you, I'm sure he's, he's instructed you on what inspiratory airflow limitation is. We treated 14 of them with nasal CPAP and it improved their symptoms of fatigue, sleep disturbance, which was for the most part insomnia, pain, and gastrointestinal symptoms. 
Um, for those of you who will get the bibliography later, the, um, the papers are references six through nine. You'll be able to pull out and, and look at uh, any of these that interest you. The other thing I will tell you right now is that the first portion of this talk uh, is reference two in a debate I had with Dr. Nuresh Punjabi considering the causes of hypersomnolence in sleep apnea. And that showed up in sleep medicine reviews last year. Reference two is everything you need to know concerning the Sleep Heart Health Study and the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study with their references. We then looked at 12 lean females with irritable bowel syndrome. This was funded by a seed grant from the VA. And we demonstrated that um, among the, uh, the, the, the 12 lean females with irritable bowel syndrome, and they were taken from each of four decades of life, three each from 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and 50 to 60. So we had 12 spaced out along adulthood, and every one of them showed inspiratory airflow limitations during sleep. We're talking about body mass indices here of about 19. Healthy controls, strictly matched healthy controls, did not demonstrate inspiratory airflow limitation until they were above age 40. I think Kingman took this paper, um, and I'm grateful to him for it. And then a controlled study, and then the controlled study of inspiratory airflow dynamics during, during the sleep of veterans with Gulf War illness and a sham controlled treatment trial with nasal CPAP. This is the one that we're going to focus on because this one broke the floodgates open in terms of our understanding of the pathophysiology of sleep disordered breathing. We published two papers in sleep and breathing. Um, inspiratory airflow dynamics during sleep in veterans with Gulf War illness, a controlled study. And the second was um, the effect of nasal continuous positive airway pressure on the symptoms of Gulf War illness. This is also a sham controlled trial. So I'll give you the results of the two studies. Compared to 11 veterans of the first Gulf War who remained without symptoms of fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, and body pain, which was how Gulf War illness was being uh, defined for research purposes uh, back when we did the, the, the grant, and were matched for age, gender, and BMI. 18 veterans with Gulf War illness had a higher AHI, 18 versus three, and a much higher frequency of flow-limited breaths during stage N2 sleep. 96% of their breaths were flow-limited, versus 36% in the group that came back and remained free of symptoms of Gulf War illness. We then took the 18 patients, divided them in half, and compared to nine veterans with Gulf War illness, treated with sham nasal CPAP for three weeks, the symptoms of Gulf War illness worsened slightly. Eight veterans treated with nasal CPAP, these are veterans with Gulf War illness, um, treated with nasal CPAP for three weeks, experienced a marked decrease in the severity of their symptoms, particularly fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, and body pain. The reason we only treated eight was that one checked himself into an inpatient PTSD program before we could get him on CPAP, and so we had to drop him uh, from the study. So that's what we found in the two studies, but there was something that broke through here that was very important. And that was that, and I hear what I'm showing you is a patient who received CPAP and who had a marked improvement in his symptoms. And you're looking at a hypnogram and you're seeing a large number of shifts from deeper to lighter stages of sleep. REM to any non-REM stage. Here we have um, N3 to N2, N2 to N1, uh, any stage to wakefulness. And you're seeing lots of up and down, up and down throughout sleep with a large total for the night of sleep stage shifts. And here we're counting only deep to, uh, to lighter shifts, not the other direction. And then after three weeks of nasal CPAP, they've all disappeared. And the total sleep time has decreased. These are both in-lab polysomnograms. 
and the patient is sleeping a heck of a lot less and feeling a heck of a lot more awake and less fatigued. And this is very typical in sleep disorder breathing. The, the, when the patients are doing well in CPAP, they sleep less time. Their sleep is more restorative. And the sleep late stage shifts is down. Well, my, bi my biostatistician, my brother, Dr. Morris Gold, said to me, hey, if you, you got to explain something here. What's happening is that your change in total of sleep stage shifts for the night is correlating with the change in the severity of the symptoms. And that's in both directions. In the patients who are getting better, there's a drop in the sleep stage shifts total for the night. In the patients who are in shame and getting worse, there's an increase in the sleep stage shifts for the night. Now, when cross-sectional data correlates, he told me, you know, that's nice. But my brother works for the, for the pharmaceutical industry. And he says, when a change in the severity of symptoms is associated with a change in a physiological parameter, now you're talking cause and effect. So you got to tell me why these sleep stage shifts have this relationship to symptom severity. And I had no idea. But, um, but ultimately, after reading, and this is important, a reference, and I'm giving you the reference, I'm not going to go through the paper with you, but it's a, a, recent, a, a review paper, it's reference 10 by Ursula Voss. This is an annotated bibliography, so you'll be able to find it. The paper, she is a uh, clinical psychologist at the University of Frankfurt, and she wrote the paper, Functions of Sleep Architecture and the Concept of Protective Fields. Uh, it was in reviews in neurosciences, and everybody should read this who's involved in sleep medicine. Basically, she's explaining how sleep stage shifts are essentially an adaptive mechanism for conditions of stress. It's a survival mechanism. By, by shifting from, from um, deeper to lighter sleep, frequently a person in danger will not die while they're unconscious. Right? This is a very good situation for a soldier in a foxhole. If you're constantly shifting to lighter sleep, you're more likely to catch on to a danger before that danger kills you. And she takes you through not only humans, but predators and, and prey and the sleep of whales who, who are at risk of drowning. Um, she takes you through everything and shows you that, um, that increased sleep stage shifts is a manifestation of increased stress. Now, I read this and I said, okay, but I'm a pulmonologist. What's stress? And I had no idea. So I Googled stress. And I found, I found a book, The Stress of Life, written by Dr. Hans Selye. Quickly, he's an endocrinologist from the first half of the 20th century who discovered the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis uh, and its role in preparing humans for life-threatening conditions. And the book, The Stress of Life, opened my eyes to sleep disordered breathing. So very quickly, I wrote a paper on this. It appeared in 2011, I believe, in Sleep Medicine Reviews, a theoretical review on the functional somatic syndromes, anxiety disorders, and the upper airway, a matter of paradigms, in which I introduced a stress paradigm for sleep disordered breathing. And this paper has very nicely gone largely unread. Um, but here's what I learned. And you focus right here, because if you're awake, this is going to blow you away. So here we have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Under conditions of stress, corticotropin-releasing hormone is put out, which from the hypothalamus, which stimulates the pituitary to do two things. The first thing is something that nobody really focuses on, but it is very important. If you're under life-threatening conditions, you do not need to reproduce or to grow. If you survive, you can go back to doing that. So the first thing the pituitary gland does 
is it cuts down on gonadotrophic hormone and on growth hormone. And what does that result in? Duh, erectile dysfunction and polycystic ovaries, decreased testosterone and decreased um, uh, estrogen, essentially. And a fair amount of that estrogen um, or the, the, the metabolic byproducts that would have gone on to estrogen become androgens. And so there's hirsutism. Um, now, anybody know where erectile dysfunction and polycystic ovaries are, are, are heard about? That's right, sleep apnea. Erectile dysfunction is caused by sleep apnea, it is claimed. And here's one for you. People believe that polycystic ovarian syndrome causes sleep apnea. It's those androgens and how they cause sleep apnea. That's not what Selye would tell you. He'd tell you it's exactly the opposite. It's the stress caused by the sleep apnea that is causing polycystic ovaries. And of course, without growth hormone, you end up with short stature. And of course, after they take out kids' tonsils, there's a big growth spurt, right? right? So we're looking at sleep apnea consequences here. But then what else does the pituitary do? It puts out ACTH, which then puts out glucocorticoids and causes hyperglycemia, it puts out mineralocorticoids. Now, this is Soye's book. He last updated it in 1976, right before he died. So do not, this is not the entire picture of the HPA axis as we would view it today, but this is how Selye viewed it. So you have mineralocorticoids and he attributes hypertension to them um, as well as preeclampsia in women and augmented inflammation. That's interesting. But these are the three consequences he attributes to mineralocorticoids. And then the hypothalamus also stimulates the nucleus locus ceruleus in the brainstem which puts out norepinephrine. And so you've got, you've got hypertension and norepinephrine and you end up with myocardial infar infarction. You've also got adrenaline or epinephrine coming out of the adrenal medulla. Um, and lo and behold, you've got metabolic syndrome down here. So tell me something. I read this book about 15 years ago. Do you suppose my eyeballs popped when I saw the consequences of chronic stress. I've been telling this meta, the world of sleep medicine that sleep disordered breathing is a disorder of chronic stress. I wrote a review paper on it. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. In chapter nine of his book, Solye gives the 31 warning signs of chronic stress. And I've written all 31 of them out. Those are the italics here. And then I also summarize them uh, to point out where these warning signs of chronic stress are also the signs of um, the functional somatic syndromes. So there's body pain, pain in the neck or lower back, headache, he describes migraines, irritable bowels or bladder syndrome, diarrhea, indigestion, queasiness of the stomach, sometimes even vomiting, and then irritable bladder, the frequent need to urinate, um, sleepiness and fatigue, predilection to become fatigued, loss of joie de vivre. He was from the, the EU, Dr. Uh, that's why he uses some of these terms. But here, I thought he had more to do with depression, but uh, I left it under fatigue. Cognitive dysfunction, right? Brain fog, inability to concentrate, flight of thoughts, and general disorientation. Depression. Right, that uh, depression he lists, emotional instability, the urge to run and hide, the urge to cry. Okay, then we have somatic arousal, which is also known as anxious arousal. It's the symptoms of increased sympathetic tone, pounding of the heart, dryness of the throat uh, and mouth, floating anxiety, emotional tension or alertness, uh, trembling, right, Nerve t uh, ner nervous tics, you know, trembling of your eyelids, um, tendency to be easily startled. These, these are symptoms of increased sympathetic tone. Uh, and then he describes insomnia, bruxism, which we saw under the functional somatic syndromes. So the functional somatic syndromes are simply the manifestations of chronic stress. 
And where is that stress coming from? Well, I'm hypothesizing it's coming from sleep disordered breathing. So the bottom line appears to be that snoring, inspiratory airflow limitation during sleep, in some individuals, serves as a chronic stress. It gives rise to the symptoms characterized in the functional somatic syndromes and the metabolic disorders complicating the course of, complicating the course of obstructive sleep apnea, such as arteriosclerotic heart disease, stroke, erectile dysfunction, PCOS, and type 2 diabetes. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time and I didn't get to the end. We have begun to quantify stress in sleep disordered breathing. Um, I'm going to tell you this. Um, Sushil, can I talk to you about something? Yeah. Can I, can I call this portion of the talk for people who need to leave? Let them yeah, answer. yeah, I don't know if do you want to Let take a answer. break and Let maybe see if anybody questions. has questions before they leave and uh, then yeah, we can kind I will, of shift. I will, I will finish this in the second hour and show you where this, where, it, where this comes down to the causes of sleepiness now in, in sleep disorder breathing. But is, is there anybody who needs to leave and really has a question they'd like to ask, anything? Or feel free to throw it in the chat too. I can read it out there if you don't want to do it. Yeah, and you can put, it, put any questions you want through to, to Sushil. I'm going to keep going. I will stop at any point. The, 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 the one question I would ask you, Abe, is you know, from, from my end, uh, would just be like, you know, you focused a lot of the talk on, on, on sleepiness, right? You know, uh, and so what I'm just sort of curious in, in this work that you've done, has there been sort of an evolution in terms of looking at beyond sleepiness and whether you see similar associations with the construct of, of fatigue? Because, right, sleep yes. docs spend a lot yes. of time trying to distinguish the two. To I'm, gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the data. I'm gonna show you the data. On that, on fatigue. And Dr. Uh, Stews has looked at, um, well, Ricardo, what, what have you, what are the parameters that you've looked at in the context of stress? Excuse me? Uh, can you say that again? Uh, I yes, Ricardo, this is Dr. Stews. What you've, you've looked at 374 patients in Dortmund uh, in the context of other symptoms besides sleepiness. Um, and its relationship to stress. What are some of the? You don't have to give for show your data, but but what are some of the other uh, symptoms that you've looked at? Oh, uh, the, the main symptoms are those that uh, often patients with sleep apnea complain of. Um, one, uh, of course, was sleepiness measured by um, the airport sleepiness scale, and uh, the other one was fatigue, and we used the fatigue severity scale. And we also looked at anxiety and used the uh, GAD-7 questionnaire for anxiety. Um, and uh, we also looked at uh, non-restorative sleep and um, at um, non-restorative sleep. And what was, what was the other one? Um, uh, insomnia. Exactly, insomnia. He's looked at all of them. I've looked actually in reference number, um, reference number, give me a second. Um, and uh, here we go, reference number 16 um, in the bibliography somatic syndrome, insomnia, and and uh, somatic arousal among sleep disorder breathing patients. I've actually looked at the frequency of the functional somatic syndromes in patients with sleep disordered breathing as a result of their stress level. So this is King. So one of the overarching themes here that I'm sensing that is not been, uh, it, it, that you know very well, which is this autonomic nervous system and its particular role in both producing uh, illness uh, 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 somatically, but also giving feedback to the brain uh, to produce uh, changes in brain function. And I think that's probably this somatic brain interface uh, 
um, that that has been so intriguing that ne that neuroinflammation sort of area that 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 we don't really understand very well that the the NIH really has, has doesn't think that's an area of interest for them compared to autonomic control of the kidney or the or the or the inflammatory bowel disease or even you know, those sorts of things. So it's a it's a a real area. I guess the question sort of becomes that it's a brain issue and why people are kind of avoiding trying, and it's a very stubborn thing to try to get at in humans, right? Very stubborn. Well, I mean, you, you want resting brain function, you want all sorts of things. Well, the, yeah, absolutely. But but we're, we're, one of the things I, I'll, I will say, and then let me, let me address two pieces of what you just said. And, and this is very important. I, and this is actually in the review paper, uh, yeah. but in, in Sleep Medicine Reviews. No, incidentally, I want everyone to know. Before I put that review paper in Sleep Medicine Reviews, I, I emailed Kinman and offered it to him. He, he turned me down and said, you know what? Send it to Sleep Medicine Reviews first. We're not really into publishing um, theoretical reviews. Um, so um, I'm not angry. About that. I'm actually, I'm very happy it got into sleep medicine reviews. But, but the limbic system of the brain is directly connected to the upper airway. Oh, yeah. We, we, yeah. I think it's the, 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 the yeah. olfactory nerve. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and they, they, ignore, they, they ignore that. I'm going to a conference in Washington tomorrow, the next day, on sleep and cognitive function. It's organized by all the cognitive cortical people in Alzheimer's who think they've discovered sleep. And there's nothing on the brainstem, there's nothing on the pons, there's nothing on arousals. And, and uh, that uh, we can tell. The only people talking about some of that is Phyllis Z and Cliff Zaper, and they were not on the organizing committee. Oh, it's really a it's a really a blind spot for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, and or I've communicated to you that we're we have a, a, a fatigue clinic for chronic fatigue referral clinic for primary care, and we're just starting to kind of you know bring that ball of yarn together with these different questionnaires and and trying to get a group together that can be more efficient in collecting. Uh, the data we want. Right now, it's primarily subjective questionnaires, but GAD and MOCA and all sorts of things. But it's interesting. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say one thing about this. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I think the smart thing for me to do now, can you say you're going to, you have to leave? No, no, I'm here for the next uh, next hour because this is the. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, hours. so we can, we can sort of make the formal transition, maybe just because we're at the end of the hour. So a lot of a lot of people will probably have to jump off or for other things they have to have to get to. Yeah. Anybody is welcome to 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 stay on. Uh you know, uh Abe, there was one additional question in 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 the chat maybe before we turn over. Uh sure. from, it's from Dr. Ibrahim, one of our, our pedi pediatric and adult sleep specialists. Um and uh she just said uh uh, regarding the flow limitation and HPA access, chicken or the egg, lots of arousals can cause changes in flow limitation? Question mark. Lots of arousals can cause change. I would I would disagree with the notion that lots of arousals can cause flow limitation. Um, I, that isn't my finding. Over time, the the snoring is. There. I mean, lots of arousals don't lead to limitation. At least that that's my perspective, Doctor Stews. What would that fit with your overall? No, well, I think that lots of arousals would um, destabilize. Would would produce um, a higher level of activation, and therefore um, the upper orbit would. <laughs> Would would stabilize more than you know? I uh, I think that um, not yeah, arouses, I'm, but what I'm just on the other side. I'm completely on the other side. Yeah, I mean the the one question it could potentially destabilize breathing right, in, in vulnerable individuals. 
it could actually be a destabilizer for you. You're saying, can you believe it? more flow limitation with more arousals? I, I think the, the transition from wake to sleep is accompanied by uh, changes in respiratory drive. And so respiratory drive, then, uh, if it's uh, reduced to a, in a vulnerable airway, will produce, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure what, how to define that exactly for everybody, but in a vulnerable airway, it will cause uh, snoring, it will cause uh, airflow uh, restriction, and uh, if it if the airway is not uh, unstable, it'll just produce a non-obstructive event. So I call these now obstructive and non-obstructive apneas. With the non-obstructive meaning that you don't have an unstable airway, and we flip our thinking to say why do humans have an unstable airway as they get older or they get stress? Uh, and, and the reason for that thinking is, is because I think that the default in evolution is to keep your airway open enough so you can breathe adequately during sleep. Yeah, I used to, I used to see it that way. I, I did. And uh, uh, the, only, the only thing I would say in response to the, to the question from Dr. Ibrahim is, is I agree with Kingman that, that the transition is associated uh, often with, with flow limitation. But, but that with stabilization, um, you, you can see non-flow limited breathing. Um, the flow limitation that I'm talking about in the functional syndrome is not transient. It's, it's present throughout sleep, as you saw in the Gulf of yeah. You have a vulnerable airway. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the, the children are tough because they, their, their, their criteria for having an apnea is so low that it must be that particular problem. But there are many children that don't have that problem, right? It's, and we, we, we're so focused on disease that we don't think of really what a healthy airway would be and how to define what a healthy airway would be, which I think is a neuromechanically, uh, uh, neuromechanical uh, feature like walking. And I think that there's a brainstem mechanism that actually keeps that keeps that open that is is lost either through stress or through through other sorts of things that 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 determine that. And you know, we're, we're betting on the cochlear fusae or we're betting on something like that in the brainstem. Yeah. So so a I mean it, it right I think a logical extension I think of you know what you're talking about right is one would take a a sleep study, for instance, that you might do on an individual, and you would characterize every breath, uh, you know, essentially as flow limited, not flow limited. You might you did that for six minutes look at, of sleep. If you yeah. had sleep, you would obviously look at sleep stage transitions, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in that in sort of Kingman's point about you know what is normal. I mean, what what do you ascribe as? "Quote unquote," a potential normal amount of flow limitation. Do you do you okay. believe in like the Dave Rappaport lab data where they kind of draw a line in the sand around thirty percent flow limitation? Okay, Probably yeah. So let, let me tell you, on, on the basis of decades of experience, um, the, the answer is not enough is known. That's the bottom line answer. Dave Dave Rappaport has a very uh, but, um, I, I don't want to. I, no, I don't mean this disparaging. He's, yeah. he's got a primitive. He's he's got a primitive definition of flow limitation. It's far more common than Dave Rappaport's criteria would. would. Um, but um, what I what I have come to is that flow limitation becomes a problem when the person who is flow limited has fatigue sleepiness, body pain, headaches, uh, irritable bowels. If you've got any flow limitation and that, you've got too much flow limitation. And I know that sounds like a wise guy answer, but that's, but there's, there's no, oh, and, and I'll tell you something else. It's not even a matter of how much flow limitation you have. It also depends on whether you're sensitive to it. And for this, we need to be, start going into the second portion of the talk, or the, the last portion of the talk. Um, but but it, it isn't going to be possible to state this is, this is too much flow limitation. 
you know, the, the, it, there's no cutoff because it's, it's a combination of having the flow limitation, but flow limitation is necessary, but not sufficient to lead to the functional somatic syndromes or sleep disordered breathing and sleepiness. Kingman, how do you want Dave to maybe spend the next 20, 15, 30 minutes? Well, I, I, mean, I, want to, I want to hear how he kind of like wraps this around. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think because we, we, we need to be able to figure out on the, with the boots on the ground, seeing these patients of yeah. what we should be thinking about when we have these particular yeah. things. Let me, let me show you that now. I, I just set the table. I feel terrible. I, I don't know how I could have set the table faster, but now I'm ready to, to serve the meal. So, Sushil? Yep, go, go. Yeah, go, can, go. I, can, I, can I motor forward? And any, yeah. at this point, anybody who wants to stop me can stop me. We're in the second hour. So, what we needed to do was we needed to measure stress. And I, I'm, I'm not going to go through our baseline studies of the body sensation questionnaire. I sent it to Sushil so you all have it. Yeah. And um, the, the background references are references 13 through 16, um, in which we've got body sensation questionnaire data on healthy, on healthy people, on people with somatic syndromes, upper airway resistance syndrome, and, um, and sleep apnea. And when you look at the symptoms here, I, I pointed out earlier on the previous slide, that these are the symptoms of increased sympathetic tone, right? These are the symptoms that Hans Selye said are markers for chronic stress. So the body sensation questionnaire is looking at the frequency of these symptoms in any individual as a marker for the presence of chronic stress. So it's a 17 item questionnaire with a Likert scale rated one to five, um, <clears throat> measuring somatic arousal or the symptoms of increased sympathetic nervous, nervous system tone. Incidentally, this somatic arousal is also known as anxious arousal. It's arousal that characterizes people with anxiety disorders, even when they're not feeling anxious. And it is also known into the sleep world as physiologic hyperarousal, the arousal that characterizes insomnia. And the scoring of the BSQ, as I'll call it, is none. If, it's, it's, if, if, every seven, if all 17 items get none, then you have a, a score of 17 for one. And uh, if they're all extremely present, then the highest score is 85. I've only seen an 85 once in my life. I've been collecting this patient, this impatience with sleep disordered breathing for 15 years. Just so you don't think this started yesterday. I've got this on all my Stony Brook patients. Okay. And now I'm going to show you a paper that my brother, our biostatistician, first authored. Um, and what we're doing here is we're looking at the role of stress, somatic arousal, in patients in the sleepiness and fatigue among, among patients with sleep disorder breathing. I believed at the time we set up this study, I believe the patients with UARS are sleepy because they are stressed. And I believe that patients with sleep apnea are sleepy because of sleep fragmentation by apneas and hypopneas. That's what I thought the truth was. I believed it just like all of you did before this lecture. So I, we collected 152 consecutive newly evaluated UARS patients. And then from the same period of time, we took 50 patients uh, consecutively with each of three levels of apnea hypopnea index, what I considered mild sleep apnea back in those days, Apnea hypopnea index of 10 to 30, moderate 30 to 60, and severe greater than 60. Of course, this pissed off all the peer reviewers who, who got this paper. You'll notice also that this paper was published 
in sleep and breathing. Thank you, Kingman. Um, and um, to, to characterize these patients, BMIs, not surprisingly, in UARS patients, these were overweight people. Uh, but in the sleep apnea patients, 150 total, they were progressively more uh, obese as their AHIs went up. <clears throat> and uh, females were about 50% of the UARS patients. That's kind of typical. And then it decreased in, in frequency as they, uh, in the sleep apnea patients, and particularly as the apnea hypopnea index went up. Now, characterizing the sleep apnea, you see we have a very, very large gradient of sleep apnea here. An AHI of four in the UARS patients, with only 4% of the night spent at saturations below 90%. And as we went up, we went to, uh, in the mild group, we had 19 for an AHI. In the moderate group, 43 for an AHI, a mean, and um, 80 for the severe sleep apnea patients who were all morbidly obese. And we went from 44% of the nights spent at saturations below 90% in the UARS group to 50% of the night spent at sats below 90% in the most severe group. And now let's look at the upward sleepiness scale, the fatigue severity scale. This is for uh, Sushil, and uh, the body sensation questionnaire scores. So this is not surprisingly, we have the exact same Epworth until we get to an AHI above 11. This is kind of reminiscent of the sleep heart health study data. Not much of a difference when you're talking about apnea hypopnea indices in the sleep heart health study was below 30, here it's below 60, but they're all identical. And this is a, an a ESS of 10, and then it goes up to 11 in the most severe. Fatigue is pretty uniform throughout moderate, and the body sensation questionnaire is also uniform throughout. I'm not sure what this 26 means, but 30 in UARS, the most severe sleep apnea, it's 29. Standard deviation is about the same. And now I want to point something out right, right now, right here. First, um, as the severity of sleep apnea and desaturation progressively rises, there is no effect on the chronic stress of sleep disordered breathing patients. These transient events, as Dr. Stews likes to call them, is not the source of increased stress among sleep disordered breathing patients. That's what you're looking at down here. And second thing is that the apnea hypopnea index, which is going up tremendously over this period of uh, the severity of sleep disorder breathing is not associated with much of a change in daytime sleepiness. Enough so that I blew it off really. I'm, I, I, you'll see by the end of this study that I'm not accepting the idea that apnea hypopnea index contributes anything, and that sleep fragmentation contributes anything to sleepiness and sleep disorder breathing. But now let's look at the data that, that Sushil wants to see. So here, I've got four plots. On the y-axis, on the top two graphs, is Epworth's, um, is Epworth's sleepiness scale and body sensation questionnaire score on the y-axis, I'm sorry, on the x-axis. So body sensation questionnaire against Epworth, body sensation questionnaire against Epworth in UARS patients and obstructive sleep apnea patients. And what we found here is a loose, but statistically significant correlation, an increase in sleepiness with increasing stress level among UARS patients. The p-value here is 0 0.006. And we just made statistical significance in the obstructive sleep apnea patients uh, at an R-value of 0.17 with a p-value of 0 0.03. But that's not what, what blew me away. What blew me away was that here, my mean AHI was four. And in this group, my mean AHI was 44. And the, and the relationship and the regression equation for the two plots is identical. And the correlation is very similar. In other words, 
sleeps is accounting for sleepiness in the same way in the two groups. And the AHI of 44 doesn't mean a thing relative to the AHI of four. And the correlation is even tighter for fatigue. And again, they're identical. The equations are identical. And what I got out of this was that basically I had a bag with a thousand marbles in it. One bag, a thousand marbles. I pulled out 152 and I got this. I pulled out 150 more and I got that. I was pulling all my marbles out of the same bag. There was no difference between UARS and obstructive sleep apnea. And to take you where I went at this point, the question, is there a specific UARS phenotype? This is what I concluded. UARS is a fiction invented to accommodate the sleep fragmentation paradigm of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. If symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome are brought about by sleep fragmentation by apneas and hypopneas, the same contribution, and with, with some contribution perhaps from intermittent hypoxia, then UARS must be a different disorder. Why? Because it doesn't have apneas and hypopneas, and it doesn't have intermittent hypoxia. But in truth, UARS and obstructive sleep apnea are one disorder, the result of a stress response generated by some individuals to inspiratory airflow limitation during sleep. What is UARS? It's no frills sleep disordered breathing without the OSA bells and whistles attached, like apneas and hypopneas and intermittent hypoxia. As far as I were concerned, apneas and hypopneas and intermittent hypoxia in sleep apnea are hood ornaments. They don't contribute anything to the pathophysiology of sleep disordered breathing. And finally, to really piss you off, obstructive sleep apnea and UARS are one disorder. They are both UARS. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna move right on, but any point you guys feel like it, just punch me. <clears throat> No, this is this is this is fine. This He's is fine. about to kiss you on the face, not punch you. Yeah, all right. Denise the Wolf <laughs> here has been talking about this for a while. Okay. Now, now, the problem. Okay, I, incidentally, I want to just tell you one thing since we're in the second hour. Let me just look. Yes, yeah, so well, I got time. Right. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back um, to this slide. Just so you know. When I, my, my, my brother presented me with this data, and I said to him, this can't be true. This can't be true. It's got to be that the obstructive sleep apnea patients, they're filling out the, the BSQ, but maybe they're short of breath because they're big and fat. And so they get shortness of breath, but it's not the, the anxious shortness of breath of the UARS patients. Or maybe there's, they're answering... <coughs> He had the data on every answer in the BSQ, and he said, no, Ave, they're all the things, they're, their answers to the questions are perfectly harmonious. They're me we're measuring the symptoms of sympathetic tone in both groups. And at that point, I sat for six months and did nothing. I was absolutely blown away by this reality. And one day in the bathroom, six months later, because that's where all my great discoveries are made, it dawned on me. The reason there's no difference in the data is that there is no difference in the patients. And it's time you grew up and faced reality. So, and this is the end of the, this is the end of the, and here we're gonna really melt things down to what causes sleepiness and obstructive sleep apnea. And there was a problem. And the problem was I knew better. I knew that apnea hypopnea index is correlated with sleepiness and sleep apnea from my own. And so I'm gonna start by showing you a very interesting 
analysis was done at Hopkins by Naresh Punjabi. Um, it's, an, it's an analysis of MSLT data on sickness in 900 Hopkins clinical patients being evaluated for the first time with obstructive sleep apnea. He's using the Hopkins, uh, the Hopkins criteria for severity of sleep apnea. So mild is 10 to 30, moderate 30 to 60 for the AHI, and above 60 uh, is severe. And I'll the criteria in my analysis later on. He's using, he's looking at the MSLT, and this is great. He's looking at the MSLT like survival analysis. The MSLT, we take a patient, we put him in bed, we give him 20 minutes to fall asleep, and we see what percentage remain survive awake in each minute in bed. And here it takes out 10 minutes, but these patients all went out 20 minutes. So you can analyze the data using survival analysis. And, and the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to go to the 50% mark. I'm going to see that in the severe group, that's this one with an AHI above 60, by the time two and a half minutes into the MSLT, by medium sleep latency, half is a full sleep. In the group with an AHI of 30 to 60, it's about five and a half minutes. Five, half of them to fall asleep. And in the group with the mildest sleep apnea, it takes maybe seven, seven and a half minutes till they, till they fall asleep. So, so you see then that by looking at the position of the curve on the graph, you show increasing severity as AHI increases. And in fact, uh, that showed that all three differed from each other. AHI was associated with um, the severity of hypersomnolence. But there's something else I want to call you with your attention to. Let's just look at the group with the mildest sleep apnea, 10 to 30. Some of these patients fell asleep in the first minute or two. Even though their sleep apnea was relatively on the mild side, whereas others were still awake 10 minutes into the MSLT. So there's a second, in each level of AHI, there's a, a second factor that seems to be determining how quickly they fall asleep. Something else is also controlling sort of on hypersomnolence in, this, in these patients. And it's true at every level of severity of sleep disordered breathing. And the question is, what is that thing? I'm much interested. This is 1998, right? 19, 1999. Yeah. So he, he didn't really, he wasn't all that interested. He did a nice piece of work. 900 patients. This is great. But, but he was not much interested in any other causes of sleep of sleepiness besides the things that standard uh, sleep conditions would, would be concerned about. In 2008, um, we looked at the same sort of approach at hypersomnolence, but we included upper airway resistance syndrome in our, in our analysis. And in fairness to my brother, my brother did much more sophisticated um, analysis. And I'm not going to show you everything we did here. I'm going to stay right on target. Um, this is the equivalent of Nuresh's chart that we just showed you. So, and, and then notice it's the same criteria as, as Nuresh. 10 to 30. Is somebody asking a question or is that just a background noise? Uh, no. Okay. So, so AHI of less than 30, 30 to 60, greater than 60. Here we have the group with greater than 60. And you can see, just like in the ratio, well, I took us a little longer. A lot of people didn't fall asleep until about five minutes in the, in the most severe group. But, but still, you have the most severe group is positioned to the left. You have the moderate group in the center. But the moderate group is kind of funky looking. And um, the latest AHI of, of 10 to 30 is here on the outskirts. And we, did, we, we had only 220 patients in our, in our um, so roughly 70 in each curve. And what we were able to show was that the group with the most severe sleep apnea was significantly more sleepy than either of the other two 
Mm -hmm. We couldn't show a difference between mild and moderate, and we, but, but both moderate, mild and moderate were less sleepy than severe. And look at this shape for the, for the mild, for the moderate. There's initially, it almost drops down like the severe group, but then after about seven minutes, um, it curves back and kind of parallels the mild group. So it didn't look like Nuresh's really. In this right curve, right panel, what we've done is we've taken all three of these curves and we moved them over and we made them gray. And we dropped in black a, a curve for 125 US patients. And that curve lies right on top of the mild to moderate group. In other words, as one goes from an HI of less than 10, of zero essentially, to six, there's no increase in, um, in, in sleepiness. But once you go above 60, now you're significantly more sleepy. That parallels the data I showed you in the BSQ study, where above 60, there was finally in, in the upper sleepiness scale. It also parallels the finding in sleep heart health study that above 30, that's when you saw a, a major increase uh, based on AHI in sleepiness. So this, this, keeps, this keeps existing here. And when I looked at this, I said, you know, I just had my rant against AHI having a role in, in, uh, in the severity of sleepiness and sleep disorder breathing, but our very own research from 2008 shows that AHI is a factor. And we have to come up with some explanation for this. And so my brother said, look, Abe, how about this? This middle group, where we were, this group from 30 to 60, this is actually, this is actually a, a, a mixture of two groups. The increase in sleepiness is not continuous across AHI. Below a certain AHI, people are equally sleepy. But then suddenly, there's an HI above which everybody becomes sleepier. And to make a long story short, he took out this central group, and instead of dividing it, instead of creating one group with an HI of 30 to 60, he took out both the mild and moderate group, he combined them. So we got an HI of 10 to 60, and then he divided it at 45 to make two curves a curve of 10 to 45, and a curve of 45 to 60. I'm going to show you that right here. Here is the curve for 60 and above in black. Here is the curve for UARS in black. Here in, in red and orange is the curve for 10 to 45. And here is the curve of 45 to 60. It falls right on top of the group of 60 plus. In other words, at 45, there's a sudden stepwise increase in sleepiness among sleep apnea patients. And that is where that increase in Epworth at age is above 30 in the sleep heart health study or above 70 in our uh, uh, body sensation questionnaire data uh, that we showed you. That's where it's coming from. Something happening suddenly at 45. And last slide of this presentation. Oh, not the last slide. This is the slide I promised Ricardo I was going to show. So here's the problem. I told you that I there was there was a second factor controlling sleepiness besides age, and that's why there was this gradual uh, change in sleepiness with some people being highly sleepy at any AHI, and others being sleepy at all. And I thought, gee, maybe what's controlling this gradual drop off is the stress level. Maybe people with an AHI of 10 to 45 who are very stressed because of their inspiratory airflow rotation, they're going to sleep very quickly. But if they have less of a stress response or no stress response, they may still be awake at 20 minutes out. So that if we go down this curve, and we map out at each line the average BSQ of all the people remaining awake will go from the highest BSQ values up here and gradually will come down to the lowest BSQ values down there and we'll be seeing both causes of sleepiness. 
stress along each curve, and HI, the position of the curve on the plot. Maybe. We didn't have this data. We didn't have BSQ data for any study we published in 2008 because we weren't yet collected data. So we were stymied here. There was no further we could go. But I will tell you, Ricardo has this data today, and he could look at what BSQ is what causes this, um, this difference in sleepiness along each curve. So what did Ricardo do? Well, Ricardo, right now, this is a manuscript that is revised. It's undergoing a second peer review at Sleep Medicine. It's, uh, it describes a case series of 374 newly diagnosed uh, German patients with obstructive sleep apnea in Bartman. Um, he, uh, Ricardo translated the BSQ into German. I want you to know, at Stony Brook, we also translated it into Portuguese and given a copy to uh, Luciana Palombini in, um, in Sao Paulo. She's with the Sao Paulo um, Epidemiologic Sleep Study. I, I haven't spoken to her in a while. I'm hoping she's using it now in that group. Um, and um, the study compares data obtained um, by both Ricardo and my brother. It was, it was uh, obtained by Ricardo and it was analyzed together with my brother. And they're com comparing it to the data that I just showed you uh, regarding sleepiness and fatigue um, against uh, the BSQ. And it also extends uh, to other symptoms uh, noted in, in sleep apnea patients. Um, and Ricardo, to his credit, had more confidence or has more confidence in the AHI than I do. He tried to look at the AHI and, and the BSQ together. What they did was on the x-axis, they broke the BSQ into three levels of severity, 17 to 25. Remember, 17 means no stress. 25 is a light level of stress. 26 to 35. Right? So now we're in the range of, of most sleep apnea patients, and greater than 36. This is a very high stress level. And then he plotted three curves based on three levels of apnea hypopnea index, 0 to 15, 15 to 49, and 50 and up. And take it one at a time. First, we'll point out at each level of severity of sleep disorder breathing, there is a gradual increase in sleepiness by the upwards as BSQ rises. Everybody in agreement? Okay, I'm gonna assume everybody's in agreement. But something really weird happens when you look at the AHI. Basically, from, from zero to 50, there's no difference in sleepiness by the upwards with the difference in the AHI. And suddenly, miraculously, at HI of 50, there is a step rise, remember that term? increase in sleepiness. What I'm saying is that Ricardo, in his data, has found exactly what I just showed you using SLT data. Ricardo has the BSQ data, and it makes me optimistic that using the BSQ data uh, you can show the change in sleepiness at any given AHI along any curve. And now the final thing I'll tell you is that although he didn't analyze the data in this study, Ricardo also has MSLT data on all these patients so that he can actually go out and publish the paper. Bringing together Epworth sleeping, sorry, Epworth apnea index and BSQ. So now I'm gonna give you an algorithm. This I promise is my last slide. Um, this, because I can't see the top. There we go, okay. Um, so, inspiratory airflow limitation, present or absent, with or without apneas and hypopneas. If you don't have inspiratory airflow limitation, you have no sleep disordered breathing, nothing to say. Yes, there is inspiratory airflow limitation with or without apneas and hypopneas. And the next question I have for you is, do you respond to this with a strict response? If the answer is no, 
Then you have non-hypersomnolent, silent inspiratory flow limitation, or non-hypersomnolent snoring, primary snoring, or you have OSA with no sleepiness. We all know that we've all these patients exist. But if the answer to this is yes, you have a, and here's the stress response on the side. If you do have this response, then this question is, okay, do you have an AHI of greater than 45? Or perhaps 50? If the answer to that is no, your AHI is less than 45, then you have obstructive sleep apnea um, with hypersomnolence, or you have UARS um, with hypersomnolence caused by stress and stress alone. The answer is yes, your AHI is greater than 45. Then you have obstructive sleep apnea with hypersomnolence caused by stress and perhaps sleep fragmentation or something connected to AHI that, that drives your, um, your sleepiness level higher magically in a stepwise fashion around 45 to 50. The other thing I want to point out about this stress response, I showed you only body sensation questionnaire, but let's let's be honest, cytokines are also a response to stress, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin six, these cause sleepiness. And in fact, Vagansis 20 years ago gave a tenorosept to patients with sleep apnea uh, without treating them with CPAP and made them sleepy. So and and the truth the truth is. Vagansis was the first person to consider stress, although he didn't use the term stress. He considered sleep as a manifestation of metabolic syndrome. And sleepiness was all part of the metabolic syndrome, and it was related to cytokines. Um, that's, my, that's my algorithm. Uh, I'm going to shut my mouth now and leave it open to anything anyone wants to, to say. So Abe, are you using the, you're using the body sensation questionnaire as a stand-in for the stress response? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And, and, the, the, and to, to go back to my talk, the body sensation questionnaire is Cellier's, Cellier put this together in 1950 before there were functional somatic syndromes. It was Cellier's pre-1 symptoms of chronic stress. <coughs> This was the sympathetic nervous system symptom piece of it. Yeah. It's my marker for chronic stress. The, so the point it, doesn't, is, it, it doesn't have to be the best one. In fact, I will tell you, I suspect it's not good at picking up low levels. <coughs> of there can be a fair amount of stress until you develop symptoms. Yeah. So is the point you're with your algorithm, I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. So how do you think about this? this non hypersomnolent silent IFL group, I guess. They, they don't have a stress response with your diagram, but you know, they could be, are you saying that uh, you, you, you wouldn't necessarily, you, you would leave yeah. them deep, that they're hey, fine? No, I, you know, I wanna ask a question before I, um, yeah. before I answer that. My brother here? He was, he was bouncing in and out, but I think- Yeah, he was curious. I'm, I'm back, I'm back. You you want to do you want to address what would you make of a of a patient who snores um, um, but might have a BSQ that's in the normal range? Um, wait, five, wait five years. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, what I will tell you is this: I, I have I I can think of a, a particular experience I had with a patient. Who, who really did not want to go on CPAP. And uh, he, was a, he was a friend. And, and he said to me, he said, look, Dave, I don't really want to use CPAP. Yeah, I snore. I even have an AHI of 20. I'm not sleepy. I don't have, I don't have metabolic syndrome. I don't have anything. Do, do I really need to, to be using CPAP? PSQ was 20. And I said to him in those days, 
No. I'll, you know, just watch you. And if you, um, if you, you know, develop some of these symptoms in the future, there's always time to start CPAP, but based on, you know, I don't see stress, I don't see symptoms, I don't see anything. You don't want to use it. All right, you know, it was a friend I gave in. A few years later, that non-smoking friend had a filmmaker, left Maine, carnal artery occlusion. Fortunately, he got to the emergency room very quickly. They opened him up and his heart pumps normally today and he nasal CPAP for the rest of his life. But, but it is very clear to me that you can have enough stress to do you harm and have a, a relatively normal value to, to, uh, to your BSQ. I, I would view the BSQ as this. The BSQ is better than nothing. And the BSQ is what has enabled me to speak scientifically about stress as an important marker for hypersomnolence with disordered breathing. Um, but eventually, when the rest of the sleep disordered breathing world wakes up and realizes that what I just described today is consistent with the sleep heart health study, that there are two factors in hypersomnolence and sleep apnea, snoring and AHI, AHI through AHI, snoring through stress. Everything I'm saying is what the data that, that exists over 30 years in sleep disorder breathing will support. Now, everybody's got to climb in, each with his expertise, and start fleshing this out. There are loads of people out there who know cytokines a hell of a lot better than I do. Right? I'm, my job was to point everybody in the right direction. But I'm not the one who's going to, you know, I'm not the one who's going to do this by myself. And it would be fine with me if somebody comes along with a much better marker for stress. Fair enough. Right? But, but in the absence of something better, everybody should be recording the BSQ. And if anybody has a question that they want to ask, you know, with a very, very, very large number of new sleep disorders that all filled out the BSQ, I've got 15 years worth of data. I haven't logged it all together. I haven't collected it all. I can give you a BSQ data up the wazoo. If you've got, if you've got a question. So, so, um, oh yeah, that, that's where I'm at with the, with the body sensation question. So here's the so, dangerous, here's the dangerous.